I think as parents, we assume that kids are going to just know the right way to do things. You have to teach them first and then train them by teaching them to do it over and over again until they actually get it. Imagine trying to teach your child how to tie his shoes without the practice principle. If the practice principle is vital for teaching such morally neutral tasks as tying shoes, how much more important is it for training children in Christ-like character? I speak to parents all the time who come up to me and they see what's happening, but they don't know what to do. And I just want to stand up and say, you can do this. Here is a solution. This is Yvette Hampton, host of the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. Join us each week for a new episode as we offer encouragement and resources on biblical discipleship from popular speakers and authors, as well as parents just like you and me. Find out more at schoolhouserocked.com or listen anywhere you find your favorite podcast. Good morning, everybody. It's Friday. Ah, I am so excited. And look who I am with. I'm with Abinella. That's what we call her in our family because we've decided why waste your time saying Abby Renella when you can just say Abinella. It's just so much easier. It's all about efficiency. It's all about efficiency. And as homeschool moms, we want to make the best use of our time. So (laughs) So Abinella it is. (laughs) Have you ever seen, you know how people will text and they'll say like uh, the letter R and the letter U for RU instead of actually spelling out RU. And I saw a sign once and it said, I wonder what the people who use RU do with all the rest of their spare time. Oh my (laughs) goodness. That is hilarious. Hilarious. So So I never (laughs) text the letter R and the letter U just so you know. You don't? Ruh? Never. I, uh-huh. I, n- I don't do LOL either. No, because I could never figure out if that's lots of love or laugh out loud. I still don't know. So I don't want to like tell someone that I'm laughing at their pain when I should be saying I, lots of love sent your way. Uh, did you also um, did you also ever see the one where the emoji that's the praying hands is really a high five? Right. <laughs> someone said when you say, you know, my mom was just in a car accident and someone says praying, but it's really like high five. <laughs> Anyway, so we got to be careful with that kind of stuff. We do have to be careful with that kind of stuff. Yes. We really do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is why we have fun together, Abby, because yes, we talk is. about dumb things that it is. And know. I don't know how you're going to segue this. So you might just want to cut to the chase. <laughs> so this conversation <laughs> is just over. <laughs> it's over. Can you tell that Abby and I have had a very long and exciting week? Um, <laughs> it has been so much fun. For those of you who have joined us this week, we have been beyond blessed by your encouragement, your comments, um, your interaction on all of these sessions has been amazing. When we, we've never done anything like this before. This, like this was all new to us, this whole on, <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. <clears throat> I have never in my life even watched an online conference ever. <laughs> <laughs> not an online homeschool conference, not an online anything. Like I've seen online master classes and, you know, talks of course, but I've never actually watched an online conference. So I'm like, Oh, we're flying by the seat of our pants. I, I really actually don't know what we're doing. <laughs> uh, but by and, the comments and people writing in, we are grateful that God is using it because it sounds like God, that God is using it. So let us know in your comments. Um, you know, we want questions and comments in here because sometimes it's nice to know we're talking to other people. <laughs> yes. Yes. We love hearing your comments and your questions. Uh, but thank you guys for just being with us this week. It has been so much fun. And, and you guys keep keep commenting and blessing uh, and saying what a blessing it has been. It has been a blessing to us. I mean, as I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm the one who's getting to talk to all these speakers and Abby's getting to talk to them. And we are as blessed as you are, you are by their wisdom Mm -hmm. and just insight um, into homeschooling and parenting and marriage and, and, and life, this whole thing that we call life that God has called us to, he has called us to this. He has called us to this parenting thing, to this, 
marriage thing to, to this homeschooling thing, all of this. And sometimes we can get so wrapped up and feeling like we're not doing it right. We're not mm-hmm. doing enough. Everyone else is doing it better than I am. And, and just feeling so inadequate. And, and I said this, I, I actually don't even remember what session it was, but we were talking about, you know, teaching our kids that you know, just the love of Jesus, that Jesus mm-hmm. loves them so much, but moms, Jesus loves you yes. so much too. He cares so much about you. He sees you. He sees your struggles. He hears mm-hmm. your prayers. He knows exactly where you are and he is with you and you're not in this alone. Okay. It's not that you're just not in this alone. You know, um, you, you've got a community around you of, of other homeschool families, but you have the Lord. You have right. the God, the creator of the universe who knows everything about you and he loves you so much. Right. And so just keep keep at this, you guys. And so this is what today is all about. Um, we, every day we've had kind of a, a theme of the day. And today our theme is let's go. Let's do this, you guys. Let's do this. If you feel like giving up, don't give up. We're going to do this together. We're going to do this. We're going to pray for one another. We talked earlier in the week about just uh, the importance of community and that if you don't have a community around you, a local community, use social media in a way that that can bring community, a, a good, solid community around you. And so I know many of you have actually been connecting with one another behind the <laughs> scenes, which is so amazing. Send each other friend requests and then message each other. And that's how Abby and I got to know each other. Actually, um, we're, you know, we're each other's, you know, a couple of each other's <laughs> best friends now. I mean, it's incredible. And we, we have actually only ever met in person one time. Yep. And, um, and we live what, 2000 miles so from each miles. other. <laughs> yeah. She's in Idaho. I'm in Georgia. And so we're far apart distance wise, but mm-hmm. we talk daily. Um, and so God is just so faithful in that. And, and actually all of my best friends live thousands of miles away from me. And so God can use that to yes. bring encouragement to you and to build, build friendships. So yeah. anyway, so today we're talking about just let's do this. Let's go. Let's do this together. And one of the things that we want to kind of bring it all back around to is why the Mm -hmm. why of homeschooling, you know, why, why does it matter? And Abby and I have talked a whole lot about this. We've done a few podcasts about it together. We did one with Karen Debuse. That was just an amazing podcast. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to just bring this back around and we're going to talk with Abby today about the why of homeschooling, because if you haven't been convinced yet, by all the speakers this week, <laughs> you will be convinced by Abby um, uh, as to why this homeschooling thing and discipleship is so very important. And I want to say, and I know Abby will say this too, homeschooling is not the gospel. This is not what saves our kids, mm-hmm. but it is a fantastic way to pour into the hearts of our children. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. But for those of you maybe who are like, who's this Abby lady? <laughs> <laughs> Abby, introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah. Um, my name is Abby Rinella, and um, it's always hard to introduce myself um, because that's what I say. So I think there's two different things. What do I do and who am I? So I am I am the co-host of the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast um, with Yvette. We co-host together. I am the director of my local homeschool support group. I am a, on the board of directors for my state, for the I, um, Homeschool Idaho, our state organization. I'm a writer and a speaker in both the homeschool community and also the outdoor industry. Um, we, we do a little bit of both, but those are really just things that God has called me to do. Who I am is a child of God. I am a child of God. I'm, um, the wife of my dream man, the mom to three kids. Um, and I am a sinner saved by grace. I am a mom that every day gets up and cries out to God for the strength and the energy to homeschool. And I am in the trenches with you. I have, I have kindergarten, um, all the way up to middle school. So, um, I get it. I get it. And I get to share God's wisdom with you because honestly, it's the, it's the only thing that keeps me going. So, um, know that I'm in the trenches with you know that I understand how hard this can be, but how rewarding it can be. And Yvette said, um, if you haven't already decided to homeschool, I can convince you. But the truth is, um, I don't want to convince you. I want to share with you what God says, because God, 
believe it or not, God does say something about this. And um, if God can't convince you, <laughs> then nobody can. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is the why of homeschool, but not my why, not Yvette's why, um, not even anybody else's why, but really the reason that we're doing this and the foundation of this. Yes, that's right. So I'm I'm excited. I say, uh, let's let's just dive in. And if you guys have questions, you've been doing such a great job of this. Just write the word question in front of your questions and keep the comments going. Um, we love to see them. Uh, but yeah, put in your questions and we'll we'll answer them as we can. We may, I don't know, we may try to get to some in the middle of this. If not, we'll get to them at the end. Um, but yeah. please definitely let us know what your questions are and regards to homeschooling. So all right. Yeah. So Abby. So let's go. Let's talk let's about go. why we homeschool. Let's, let's role play a little bit. I'm a mom. Okay. I come to you. I'm like, you know, Abby, I've been hearing about this homeschool thing and I just don't think it's for me. Oh, yeah. Why? Well, I, I, <laughs> it's not for me either. I don't think it's for any of us. Unless, <laughs> so let's figure out why we're doing it, right? Why would I spend all day, every day at home with my children when I could put them on the bus and go get a coffee and go exercise and go shopping? Um, why would I do that? Um, so the first question I want to say is why ask why? Um, why are we even asking why do this? Why don't we just do what we want to do? And if it changes, we do something else. But God tells us in first Peter that we need to have an answer for everything we do. And so the first thing I ask people who aren't homeschooling is why are you putting your kids in public school? Because really why I homeschool and why you put your kids in public school and why am I making, you know, this for dinner tonight and this for, why are we doing anything that we're doing? Um, and I think sometimes people aren't homeschooling because they haven't asked themselves why their kids are in public school. Is it just because that's what you do? That's what my parents did. That's that's just what the world does. Um, so my biggest challenge is ask the question, why are we doing this? Because there has to be a solid foundation as to why we're doing this. Otherwise, we're going to quit. Um, so we're going to discuss some of the reasons people say. Um, it, what, what are some of the reasons people homeschool, Yvette? Oh, many, many reasons. Discipleship yeah. for us is okay. is our main reason. All right. We want I to be hear, the ones to pour into their hearts. To pour into your kids. I hear a lot of things, freedom. You know, we can start school when we want. We can end school when we want. We can teach to our kids, you know, gifts and talents. We can... Um, we can make our own schedules. That's a huge one. We can build family relationships. Um, and for me, when I started, it was because I like my kids. I genuinely like spending time with my kids. I'm also hardwired in that I like being home. I like doing the the homemaking things. I like teaching. I um, I like to teach. So those are a lot of the reasons that people homeschool. But the truth is, those aren't I, I hate to hurt your feelings, but those aren't good enough reasons. They're just not. Those are really, really good reasons. But what they are is they're benefits. They're blessings to homeschool. Those are kind of the, those are the things that you get after you make the real reason of why you're homeschooling. Those things naturally happen. You know, you hear, oh, my kids are, you know, they they get better grades. Academically, homeschool kids do better. Well, that that's true, but that's not why we're doing it. Um, Abby Johnson, who I don't know if you guys know Abby Johnson. She's the Unplanned. Um, she wrote the book Unplanned, and she did the movie Unplanned. And I was always, um, I love what she said about, you know, people say, well, why, why should we fight for a life? You know, and someone said, well, because that baby could have been the next president or that baby could have had the cure for cancer and you just killed that baby. And she said, you know what? That is one of the worst things we could be saying, because the truth is we're still putting value on that child's life. That child's life has value because God gave it value, not because they're going to be a president, not because they're going to do something great, but because they're humans. And so if that's your reason why, this is what she was saying. If that's your reason why you're pro-life, that's not a very good reason because what if that baby were to grow up to not be the president? Were they a mistake? No. Um, so we need to know our why for everything. I think of it also as marriage. Um, if you would have asked my husband 20 years ago when we met why he was going to marry me, if he would have said, well, because I think she's cute and she's really fun and we have a lot of the same things in, in common and she's adventurous, you know, fast forward 20 years and that's changed. You know, you, you hit 40 and you're not as cute. <laughs> And I might not be as adventurous. And sometimes after raising kids and doing things through the house, I might not be as fun. And if that's why, if that's why he married me, then it probably wouldn't stick. But if he said, you know, because I'm making this commitment before the Lord of Lords, before God, then no matter what comes our way, 
our marriage is going to stick. So it's the same with homeschool. If you're homeschooling because you want your kids to be smarter or go to a better college or be more successful or because you want to build those sibling relationships, um, then what happens when their academics aren't through the roof? What happens when they start fighting? What happens when they're really not that fun anymore? You know, I have days where I'm like, yeah, I'm really not enjoying you. Am I the only one? Like yesterday was a great day, but today I, you know, it's not my favorite. But when we make our why God's word, when we make our why God's word, then all of those things fall by the wayside and we can stay the course because homeschooling can be hard. There are going to be times where it's hard and you want to quit, and you want to give up, and all those other whys aren't making sense. They're not coming together in the big picture. And so the only thing that doesn't change, the only thing that doesn't change is God's Word. And when our foundation for why we homeschool is based on God's Word, then you're going to stay the course. You're going to be able to live through the shaky things. You're going to be able to handle it when hormones start coming around, whether they're your teenagers or yours. You're going to be able to handle it when you're doing the same math problem for the hundredth time and they're not getting it. That's going to be what stays the course. So so in that, we have to say, so then what does God's word say? You know, everybody's, okay, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. But what does God's word say about homeschool? And I used to think that the only thing that God's word said about homeschool was Deuteronomy 6, 7. You know, it's the, it's, it's the homeschool verse, right? We are um, to impress God's word on our children when they sit at home, when they walk by the way, when they lie down, when they get up. Like that's the token homeschool verse. And that is true. And that is not a suggestion. God doesn't say, hey, it would be a good idea if you did this. That's a command. God says, this is what you are to do. This is why I made you parents. This is why I gave you kids. And this is what you're supposed to do. They say, I hear a lot of people say, you know, oh, too bad kids don't come with an instruction manual. You know, actually almost every single kid that I left the hospital with, the nurses would say that as I left, you know, kids don't come with an instruction manual. And I said, they actually do. Did you know that they do? Did you know that when I was, when, when God made me a mom, he gave me everything I need to do it right here in his word. Um, but that is not the only verse in God's word that talks about how we are to teach and train up our children. It's a good one. And it's one that we need to hang on to. And it's one we need to be obedient to. But I hear a lot of parents say, well, I do that. I send them to school for academics. But you know, when when they rise up at home, we do a morning devotional before I put them on the bed. And when they get home and I put them to bed, we pray. And and so they say that. So I we just dug into God's word a little bit more. And we said, what does God's word say? Because if that is not our foundation, then we might as well throw in the towel right now because we're not going to make it. So... <clears throat> um. I want to take you, and and you guys, this would be awesome if you could just, if you just wanted to get out your Bibles with us this morning, because that's really what we're doing here is we want to, we want to point you guys and everything you do to God's word. So um, Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, does he meditate day and night? And I don't think there's a parent that is listening here that doesn't want their child to be blessed. That is a universal parental thing is we want blessings on our children. And what's amazing is God just gave you the recipe for your child to be blessed in his word right there. Um, It says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So the goal is blessings on our children. It's not how much baggage can we expose our kids to and hope and pray, you know, that they're going to be able to carry it into adulthood well. And I think that that's where we get it backwards. Um, When we say we're not walking in the council of wicked and I look at the public schools and I say, you know what? The counsel there is not biblical counsel. It's not. At the very best, it's silent about God. Um, But the truth is, is, is the schools aren't just silent about God. They're, they're, teaching things that are contrary to God's word and anything that is contrary to God's word is wicked. So they are, they are, they're standing and walking in that they're, um, it says sit in the seat of mockers. When your child sits in a seat in a place that tells them that they were not created on purpose, that they were not created for a purpose, that they were an accident of the cosmos, that they were, um, a, a product of evolution. That is mocking God. That is mocking God the God who created and designed them. And we are sitting them in the seat of the mockers when we do that. And the the truth is you go back up, they won't be blessed. 
I want my children to be blessed. And I know that you guys want your children to be blessed. So go to Psalm 1 and God tells you how to do it. It's it's not complicated. Um, and then I want to look a little bit into the, um, one, of, one of my passions is um, God's word tells us in Ephesians 6 not to exasperate our children. And a lot of people for years, I went, what did that mean? What does that mean? Um, sometimes I'm like, is making them do this math problem 15 times exasperating them? But but really, I want to look at what does it mean to exasperate your children, big picture. Um, so God says, don't exasperate them, but instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So let's talk about what it means to exasperate our children. Well, if I am building a foundation, um, a double foundation, because God says we need to build our lives on a foundation of truth, his word. And if we're building a double foundation, which means I'm building a foundation at home of God's word, my husband and I are teaching our children God's word. We are teaching them truth. We're taking them to church and in our home, we're teaching them God's word. But then I send them every day. And the reality is more hours a day than I'm spending with them. If I send them every day, to build a different foundation, a foundation based on secular thought, a foundation void of God, then every day they're building this foundation. And then they come home and I'm tearing down that foundation and building a biblical foundation. And then they go to school and they're tearing down the foundation that we're building at home. And I want to tell you that that leads to one of two things. It's going to lead to rebellion or walking away in your child, or it's going to lead to a watered down Christianity. Um, when we're trying to mold God's word in with our culture, we are going to have Christians, children that are that have a watered down Christianity. They are being taught that they can have two foundations, that they can be one foot in the world and one foot in God's word. And that is not, that is just not truth. And so that is exasperating our children every day when we're building these two foundations and they're just tearing each other down and our kids are confused. What is true? What is real? What is right? You know, on one hand, my mom and dad are telling me this at home and I'm reading this in God's word, but then the same people, my mom and dad are sending me to a place that tells me that that's all lies. Um, we're contradicting ourselves, parents. We're telling our kids to stand for truth, you know, stand for God's word, stand for truth. However, when they hand you the test at school, I need you to fill in the bubbles for the answers for lies. You know, when they ask you where you came from, you need to go ahead and fill in the right bubble that they're asking you because we need you to get an A on that test. So stand for truth, but but not at school. Um, or stand for truth in the hallways, but when your teacher talks evolution, I want you to sit quietly and listen. That is exasperating our children. How do I know this? Um, because I was a Christian kid in a public school and I was exasperated. Um, we're teaching them to be missionaries. We're telling them to go into the halls of the school, but bite your tongue, bite your tongue. You know, don't, don't, don't dishonor the teachers by telling them that what they're saying is wrong. Um, we're also making our children not trust us because I would have a really hard time as a child, if my parents were was speaking truth to me at home, but then wondering why are they sending me there then? If they're telling me all of these things, why would they send me into the lion's den? And so it's shaking our kids' trust on, on what we believe. Um, we need to build a foundation for our children that they can stand on. We need to not be building this piddly little foundation at home and then sending them out to have it tore down every day. That is is exasperation. And God is clear in his word. Do not exasperate your child. So don't take my word for it. God is telling you right there, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in truth, bring them up in his word. And how can I do that if they're not with me? Um, so, um, We'll go on to to another verse because God is full. So 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about teaching and training our children. It says that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that they are equipped for every good work. So that verse tells us how to equip our kids. Um, I was at the park not long ago and a mom said, we were we were actually with our homeschool co-op and the mom said, you know, my husband and I were talking the other night and we feel like junior high is a good time to send our kids into the public school. And I said, oh, really? Why? You know, because I'm, I'm the queen of why. Why? Why do you feel that way? Um, because I didn't want to just slam her down. I wanted to hear her heart and know why. Why do you feel that way? And she said, oh, um, because I know this woman. I know her heart is for her children. And um, she said, well, we just really discussed that we need our kids to be exposed to these things so that we can help them navigate these things. We need them to be exposed to these things so that they can learn 
to stand strong. We need to expose them to these things so that, and this is the word she said, so that they are equipped to handle the word, the world, I'm sorry, so that they are equipped to handle the world. And I stopped and I said, so exposure to sin. So you're saying to me that exposure to sin is going to equip your kids to do good, um, which really you know, this is what I, this is what's so interesting about the tickling of the ears or the thought of, of our human minds or that, you know, the heart is wicked and deceitful is that that maybe makes sense on the surface, but we have to teach and train ourselves to go back to God's word and everything because all the other moms are like, whoa, oh, that's good. Ooh, we weren't going to put our kids in middle school. We probably should now, because if we don't, you know, they're not going to know how to handle the world. And I said, wait, 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 what does God's word say about that? So we went to second Timothy and it says, I'm going to read this again. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, listen to this part so that they are equipped. So, it's not exposure to sin that's going to equip our kids. It is scripture, it is being taught and trained, it says, in righteousness that's going to help our kids stand when they come into the world. And I think that that is a lie that is throughout the homeschool community that. You know, we can do this when they're little. We're going to build this foundation when they're small. But then when they get a little bit older, we need to send them out there and we need to expose them to all these wicked, wicked things so that they're ready. And that that is a lie from the pit of hell. If you if if uh, God, that is not what God's word says, let's just say that that is not what God's word says. And anything that is not in God's word, if it's not, if it's contrary to God's word, it's a lie. So that is not what is going to equip our kids. So if we look at what this says is that scripture is used to teach our kids. Scripture is used in training our kids. Um, I just want to ask you, is that happening in the public schools? When we send our kids to the public schools, are they being trained in scripture? Therefore, they're not being equipped. So therefore, there is no equipping going on in those schools. So if you're thinking of sending them in the middle school to equip them for the real world, that is contrary to God's word. There's no equipping going on there because the only thing that's going to equip your kids to stand on a firm foundation in this falling apart world is training them in scripture and in truth. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us to unteach. You know, I'm going to send them all day. And then when they get home, I hear that a lot. I'm going to, you know, we go through what they learned and then I teach them the truth. But the Bible doesn't say, nowhere does it say unteach your children. It, from what they heard all day. It doesn't say that. It says, teach them when you're sitting at home. Teach them. You can't be doing that when they're not with you. You can't be doing that when they're all day learning lies. Um, Jeremiah 2 um, says, thus says the Lord. I love it. Thus says the Lord. Listen up, people. If it starts with that, you better listen. Learn not the way of the heathen. So, Many people say, I can teach and train my kids up in God's word when they come home. I can teach and train my kids up on Saturday and Sunday. I'm just sending them for academics. But then what about this verse? Learn not the way of the heathen. They are learning the way of the heathen if you are sending them into a place void of God every single day. Those teachers can. I was a public school teacher. Did I mention that? I was a public school teacher. I couldn't tell my kids about God. And if I did... It was very small and it was really between the lines. I could not teach and train those kids up in the way of the Lord. My mouth was shut, which is why I was no longer a public school teacher because I just was not wired to shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so those verses clearly, they're, they're very clear. They're not gray. Um, they're clear that we have a, a command to teach and train our kids up in the job. And if you want your kids to be blessed and equipped, then then keeping them at home and teaching them in God's word is the way. And, you know, um, this was just put on my heart. If you're keeping them home all day and you're not teaching and training them up in the Lord, like Yvette said earlier, homeschooling isn't the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. So if you're doing the most amazing math curriculum and your kids know Latin and, you know, you're doing all these, these incredible things, but you're not teaching them and training them up in the way of the Lord, then then that's that's not God's plan either. So the three things that we've talked so far is blessing. We Our children will be blessed through this. Um, we are called not to exasperate them, and they will be exasperated if we are continually t tearing, trying to build double foundations in their lives um, and also teaching and training them in his way so that so that they will be equipped. Um, Abby, can I can I uh, throw another verse in there? And and yeah. you might have this. Maybe you're going to yeah. get to this later, yeah. but I'm yeah. going to throw it in anyway. Okay. Um, we've talked about this this week. Luke six forty says, "A disciple is not above his teacher, but mm -hmm. everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher." So yes. who who's teaching our kids? Yep. And and let me just say, 
I grew up in a, in a Christian school. I loved the school that I went to. I was really truly discipled by some of my teachers, not all of them, but some of them. And, and even in public school, there are good Christian teachers there, but who is discipling your kids? Who is right. raising them up and, and Christian school, public school, whatever, do you know who's pouring into the hearts of your kids? And we've, we've put this number out there this week, and I'm going to put it out there again for those who mm -hmm. have missed it. When your kids are in school, from kindergarten through 12th grade, they are in the care and under the authority of someone else for over 16,000 hours. Are you kidding? You guys, let that sit. Over 16,000 hours wow. that they are under the teaching and authority of someone else. That is wow. a really long time. That's a lot of time to give up with your kids when yes. God has called us as their parents to be the ones to train and disciple them. And so 16,000 hours. And think of the foundation you can build mm -hmm. in a child. It's 16,000 hours. And don't think that there's not a foundation being built in those children that you cannot, sure. you cannot tear that foundation down in your, in your little one hour, you know, e evening Bible study and your two hours at church on Sunday. It's not going to happen. Right. Right. And uh, I mean, yeah. And even looking at that schedule, you know, they go to school all day, they come home with homework. Then you have dinner time, then they have shower time or bath time, and you might get a little bit of reading and cuddle time with them. And then they go to bed and they do it all over again the next day. Right. And, and, and just, I, I want to say too, in the setting the foundation, for some reason, we think that, well, well, we'll set that foundation for them. And you talked about this, Abby, in the elementary school years, but then once they get into middle school and high school, somehow mm -hmm. they're all of a sudden ready. Right. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. <clears throat> the Bible says that a child, an 18 year old, is still a child. A 17, 16, 15 year old, they are still children and God has yeah. still put them under our authority. And so we are still, the whole point of their childhood is to set a solid foundation for them and to prepare them for a life of serving Christ and impacting his kingdom Absolutely. in some way. And so it's not that, well, just their childhood is only up until the age, you know, of 13 or, or 12. And I mean, then no. good luck, you know, I, I, I right. mean, and those are the most, those are the most foundational. I mean, if you have had a 12 or 13 year old, let me tell you, because I, I, yeah. I'm just coming into that. I'm like, wow, there's a whole different ball game. And I don't want someone else, you know, feeding because they are, I would say that a 13 year old girl is far more vulnerable. I mean, I, it is so vulnerable. And you know, what's amazing is science, science shows us that when you study the brain, you know, that frontal lobe that it's not even fully developed until much later. These are still children. So, so this 13 year old, and I think about that when, when I want to talk about protection a little bit, cause, cause that goes to that event is when, when I was pregnant, it was unbelievable. The books that were thrown at me on how to protect that baby in my womb. Like you can't eat raw fish. Right. And I, oops, um, you have to take your folic acid every day. You know, you need to make sure that you're not, you know, skiing because that would be, that would endanger that baby that's living inside of you. And we do all of this to protect that infant. And then when we have the baby, when we, we, they hand us that baby from the hospital, um, you know, we had to have car seat checks. I don't know if anybody else did. Like we'd leave the hospital and have to check our car seat because they want to make sure that your baby is protected. Um, they have these huge mass things all over our town, making sure we're getting bike helmets on our kids. Like they're giving out free bike helmets. They're, they're making it a big thing because they want to protect our kids. We want to protect our kids. You know, I want to protect my kids. I want to make sure that my knives are put up in a way when they're little. I want to make sure I'm teaching them stranger danger. And, and I put, I put the little sign out, the little kid holding the slow down children children live here sign, right? Because we're protecting our kids. And that's a no brainer. I mean, it's almost like if you don't do those things, are you even a parent? But then, but then all of a sudden they turn five and it's not even five. This is the new thing I read um, it, around here is when they're potty trained, once they can go mm -hmm. to the potty by themselves, you know, then you can put them in because we have, you know, now public preschool program. And so I'm like, that's the standard. When my child can go to the bathroom by themselves, no longer do I have to protect them. Now I get to hand them off to someone else. And I want to, I want to challenge parents to say, you know, I'm not telling you don't be careful, but broken legs heal. Broken legs will heal if your child falls and breaks a leg. That, but there is a bigger enemy. There is a bigger enemy than just those dangers of making sure they're in their car seat and they have their helmets on. There is an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your child. Let, let me say that again. There is an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your enemy. And this isn't a scare tactic. This is truth. 
Um, so why is it that we are so concerned about physical protection for our children? Why is it that we we go around and childproof our house? Why is it that we do all of these things? And yet when it comes to their spiritual protection, we are so lazy. Why is it that we allow that we would be okay with lies being fed into our children? Moms, God made you a mama bear and he made you a mama bear on purpose and don't lose that. Do not lose that just because now all of a sudden they're potty trained and somebody else is telling you it's time to let them go. Absolutely not. Um, I want to quote, this is fun. I want to um, tell a little story that actually Garrett Hampton said, I think Yvette shared this with me, but he said, and I'm going to read it. If someone were to break into your house and you were in danger, um, you would not as a parent go curl up in the closet and hide your kids and say, you know, good luck. We're going to, we're going to pray for you over here while the enemy's after you. Um, and then when the, then when the enemy leaves and when the intruder leaves, I'm going to tell you what you should have done. Right. Right. We would never do that. We would never do that as moms. We are on the front lines to protect our children. We should be on the front lines, keeping them out of danger. Um, our children are not old enough or strong enough or knowledgeable enough to defend themselves. So take that same inborn fierceness to want to protect your child from all the physical dangers in the world and take that to the next level and say, those dangers are not nearly what the dangers, the spiritual dangers are for my child out there. And we need to carry that same fierceness until our child leaves our home and beyond. It doesn't end at five. It doesn't end at 13. It doesn't end as long as we're living on this earth, we are called to. And and so many people feel like, oh, well, you're overprotecting your kid. Well, I want to tell you something. I don't know where that term came from because I would so rather my kids leave my home and say, mom overprotected me because she, you know, she kept me from the enemy's grasp um, than my kids leaving my home and, and having all this baggage and struggling with what is truth and having this double foundation and living in this progressive world trying to, I would rather them say that because you know what? It's our job to protect. It's in us. It is, it is hardwired into parents to protect their children. Um, Proverbs 31, 8 says, speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. These are kids. Have you ever had a conversation with a teenager? You look at them like, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're not like foolishness is bound up, right? They, they can't. We are to stand there on their side to defend them because we love them, because we know the enemy. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 13 says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And this is the thing is, do you even know what company your kids are keeping out there? Do you even know? There is no possible way that you can send your kid into a school of hundreds and know what company they're keeping. It's not possible. Um, and, and I hear this a lot. Well, they have a good teacher this year. This this year, you know, my kids, my, my kids' teacher goes to church. Well, that's great for this year. But I want to tell you something. I was a teacher that loved Jesus, but I couldn't keep the lies out of those kids' heads. I have to teach a curriculum void of God. So it's not just not teaching them lies. It's that you are you are sending them into a place where they're not getting the truth. And that's terrifying because you think the enemy is not going to prowl on that. Um, this one is a big one. It's both and, and it's both in Matthew and Luke. So that's that's telling you it's in two places. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. So if someone is not with God, if you are sending your children into a secular school that does not preach the truth to your child, then they are against God. There is no neutral. Education is not neutral. Schools are not neutral. If they are not for God, then they are against God. And that's hard for some people to hear because they want to say, well, they're just doing reading and writing and arithmetic. And I say, you haven't been there lately because that's not what they're doing. And even if they are just doing reading, writing, and arithmetic, if it's not through a biblical worldview, if it is not for him, it's against him. Um, so our kids are too young. They're too immature. And they're not rooted enough to stand up in those schools. They're just not. And I want to share with you a little bit about the parent that says, but my kid is, my kid is salt and light. My kid is strong willed. My kid is solid. And I was that kid. Um, I was the kid who knew God's word. I, I had a passion for Jesus and a discernment for the lies in the public school. And I went there every day. And I want to tell you, because I was young, because I was immature, I stood all day long and I came home and I literally cried out to God to take me to heaven every night. 
And so if you have a kid that you're like, oh, but my kid's strong. Well, this is teaching them to stand up for their beliefs. That might be, and God's going to use that strength in them, but not when they're a kid because they are not mature enough. I, I take it from me and I'd love to talk to you more. Every night I'd get home from school and I felt like I was beat down because I was too little and there was no escape. And we're going to talk about that pretty soon about there's no escape for these kids when you send them. So it's not, we'll, we'll get there, but I want to tell you that even if you have a strong kid, even if you have a kid that is outgoing and they're little evangelists, I was one and I almost didn't make it. It is by the grace of God that I made it. And I carried so much baggage with me into my life trying to handle the fact that every day was a fight for my faith as a small child. It's not how God designed it. It's not what God, that's not what God tells us that we should be doing with our kids. Um, so Matthew 18, 6 says, um, if anyone causes a, one of these little ones to stumble, better to have a millstone hung around his neck and drowned. Parents, if you're sending your kid into a place every day where at very best they have to be silent, where at very best the school is silent about him, where at very best um, there is no talk of God, but more likely the reality is, is they're not silent. They're teaching your kids abortion. They're teaching your kids that life has no value. They're teaching your kids they can be anything they want to be. And if that means a girl or a boy or who knows what, that's what they're teaching your kids. And if you are not sure if that's happening in your schools, let me assure you it is. Um, some schools are just louder right now, but it's everywhere. Um, and if you think that that's not causing your child to stumble, you are very mistaken because that is causing your child to stumble. And I want to read this verse again. If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, better to have a millstone hung around his neck and drowned. And I'm not talking about the teachers causing your kids to stumble because it's your responsibility. Um, if you're putting them there, that's on you. Um, this feels like a harsh session. Um, I'm sorry. It nope. feels like a harsh session. Abby, you know bring it. It's the word of God. <laughs> um, you know we don't shy away from this stuff. No, this is why and, God's called us to do what we and, do. <laughs> and the thing is, is I, I am I'm saying this, parents, because um, because I love your kids, because your kids are our future, because your They're kids worth are worth it. And um because I love you, men and women, and I don't want I don't want you to get to the end of the road and saying, whoops, like whoops, didn't see that verse. Um, I I didn't see that verse. And uh now look where we're at. Um so I want to talk about that whole I want to talk about how God tells us to flee. Um and and hang with me here. Um, God's word is powerful. So everybody's saying, where are the verses? Where are the verses? So get ready, get your pen. They're going now. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to put them in here as quickly ready? as you're okay. saying them. <laughs> and people Timothy. are also saying, keep going, Abby. Okay. You're on fire, sister. Keep it. Um, so <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, but will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it, a way out, flee. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 11 says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And Matthew 6, 13 says, lead us not into temptation. And I wanna talk to you about what does this have to do with homeschool? Well, um, as an adult, I can flee immoral things. I can shut my TV off when something comes on that is is wrong. Um, you know, everybody's all up in arms about the Super Bowl. And I said, shut it off. Like, you have the power. Hey, newsflash, your thumb controls the remote. Like, I, shut it off. I, I don't know why this is a big conversation about the Super Bowl. Turn off the TV, for crying out loud. Um, don't support that. You can turn it off. You have that power. God says he will give you a way out. So get out. Um, I can choose, you know, if my husband goes to work and he is surrounded by ungodly men, he can, he can move away from those conversations. I can't tell you how many times a day people are talking about things they shouldn't. He can walk away from that conversation. Um, we can put the books down. If I pick up a book, um, oh my goodness, I have to tell you, this was not in my notes, but I have to tell you this hilarious thing. Um, our 93 year old grandmother, she reads because it's pretty much all she can do at this point. She just reads and reads and reads. And, um, she is 93, so she's not 100% with the program, but she heard about this top-selling book called Shades of Grey. Um, <laughs> I think that's what it's called, right? I don't know. I, I don't know anything about something the book, like but that, I know yeah. it's not something we should read. So she orders it from the library, and the people deliver because she's 93, so they bring her the things of her food. and her. 
And I tell you what, I just was like, she read one page and she put the book down. Why did she put the book down? Because she can. But anyway, we were dying when we heard that grandma. <laughs> got that book. Anyway, but here's the thing. God has given that woman discernment. God has, she has a Holy Spirit in her and he has given her the freedom to put the book down, send it back to the library, better yet, burn it. Um, we can flee as adults, but here's the thing, moms and dads, when you put your kids in a school from eight to three or whatever time your school are, those doors lock behind them and they can't flee. There is no way out. And I just read you all those verses that God commands us to flee from those kind of sins. God commands us to find a way out of temptation. And he tells us that he will give us one. But when you lock your kids in a school, where they can't shut the book. They can't because guess what? Tomorrow there's a test on it. And I can guarantee you're expecting them to take that test. Um, they can't turn off the movie. They can't because they're trapped. They're locked in. You are literally locking your kids into this place with no way out. And if you're telling me that that's not causing them to stumble, you're wrong. Because Matthew 18, 6 tells us, do not cause them to stumble. Do not ever put your child in a place that they can't flee from sin. Don't do it. It's not a part of our reality. And everybody says, go to school. They need to pre prepare for adulthood. I am sorry. That is a lie. That's not adulthood. There has never been a place in my life that I can't walk away from sin. You know, God promises he will give us a way out. So um, you're forcing your children to be surrounded by sin every single day. And then you're crying out, why are they having such a hard time? Why is this so hard? Well, it's because you're doing things contrary to God's word, and and that's what's to be expected. Um, we live in a town full of snow. We have a ton of snow, and a couple years ago, there was a huge snow, more so than usual. I mean, I'm talking four or five feet. And um, usually in the winter, we don't. We have a lot of wildlife where we live, but in the winter, we don't see a lot of that wildlife because they have learned to leave. Um, the deer migrate out of where we live. Um, so every winter the snow comes, the deer migrate out, then the snow, you know, the snow melts and the deer migrate back in. Well, one year on this huge snow, it was, it was bigger than most because um, with, we had a lot of snow back in the day and then we hadn't gotten a lot and then we got a lot and all these deer were trapped. Like we would walk out our front door and there's deer all over in our front yard and we're like, uh, there's no food here guys. Like you kind of missed the boat. You should have, you should have headed out before the snow came. And I, um, I said to my husband, I'm like, why, why this year are all of these deer? And he said, well, you know, um, fish and game is looking into that and wildlife management. And they, they believe because we had so many dry years that the generations above them, the deer did not teach their young. They didn't migrate. They didn't need to migrate out of here. They could still stay up in the Hills cause we didn't have that much snow. Um, so these generations were not passing down to the younger generations. Hey, we need to get out of here or we're going to be trapped. We're going to be trapped in this Valley. We're going to be led to slaughter because there's going to be no food and we're all going to die here. Um, and I don't think the deer have conversations like that. I think, it's more, <laughs> I think it's more subliminal. You know, they just teach them that. Um, but the deer, the the younger generations of deer were not being led away. They weren't being taught by the older generations. And so they were being led to their slaughter. And I couldn't help but think of that with my children is if we parents are not teaching our children every day um, how to flee, how to how to to be in God's word, how to be in God's will, where God wants us, how God, if we're not teaching them, then indefinitely, and then, and then inevitably you are leading your children to slaughter. You are leading your children to slaughter if you are not teaching them God's way. Um, we have to be passing this down. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. We are to teach and train them over and over. They're, these are action words that God gives us. Teach them, train them, show them. It doesn't just happen. Um, so why, why homeschool moms and dads? Um, it's not because they're going to get a better education. They will. They will. It's not because you're going to build these great sibling relationships, which you will. Um, that, that will naturally happen because anytime we do things God's way, anytime we are in God's will, um, benefits happen. We seek first the kingdom of God and all those other things are going to be handed to you. All those other things that we've been talking about all week, those will naturally happen. But you've got to seek first the kingdom of God. Your why for homeschooling your children must be out of obedience to God. Um, he created them. He created you. And he gave you a handbook to do it. And if you don't follow the handbook, you're going to have a mess. So when we build our life and, our, and make our why his word, 
Then when the really, really hard times come, because mamas, I'm telling you, they will. I'm not telling you that, hey, you know, obey God's word. And then, you know, every day it's going to be joy and laughter and rainbows. It's going to be incredible. It's not. It's hard. It is hard. And it is blood, sweat, and tears. But I am telling you, that's kind of the walk of walking with Christ. It's not supposed to be. You know, where does he tell me? I've looked, you guys, I have looked Genesis to Revelation for where it says it's going to be easy. It doesn't. It's not in there. It's going to be hard. But I will promise you, at the end of the day, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. And on the days where you're not seeing it, where you're like, all that stuff Abby talked about, I'm not seeing it. My kids are not walking with God right now. Everything's falling apart. Don't grow weary in doing good because when the time comes, the harvest will. Like it, it, it will come. Stick it out. Don't give up. Um, it'll help you get through the daily temper tantrums. It'll help you get through the daily grind. It'll help you get through the one more meal when you know that this is unto God. You are doing this unto God. You're not doing it for your kids. You're not doing it for your husband. You're not doing it because you like it or don't like it. You're doing it because the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, the Lord of Lords, the one that died for you is calling you to do this. And he's going to give you everything you need to do it. And he might not give you everything you need right this second, but he will give you this second what you need this second. Um, I want to read last verse, the one last verse. It's Luke 6. Yeah, it says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them. So so guys, your life should be changed right now because you just heard God's words. You heard God's words, right? This last hour, this last 50 minutes, you have heard God's word. So everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, so that's the key. Now we have to do this thing. I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose, do you get that when? Not if, but when a flood rose, the stream broke against that house and it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. So moms and dads, let's make sure that we're building our why on a foundation, which is God's word, so that when when the, the flood comes and hits us, that we will stand, that our children will stand, that they will be protected, and then we can enjoy all the other blessings that come with it. Yes. Oh, amen. <laughs> Abinella. God is using you, sister, in an amazing well, it's God's way. Word. It's not, I mean, it's God's word. I really it's God's word. I know. I know. It's it's incredible. <laughs> and I would love, I'm loving seeing your comments come up on this. Um, I would love to know, and, and you know, we're we're talking about the why. What is your why for homeschooling? And comment on this. Mm -hmm. And and if your why has just changed in the last yeah, 45 us. minutes. Tell us, what is your why? If someone were to ask you today, why do you homeschool? Because I'm telling you, our why has changed. When we first started homeschooling, we were running from something. We were running from, and it was more actually of a, a physical protection at the time. We were in Los Angeles. The school district um, was terrible. The school our daughter would have gone to was not good. Couldn't afford private school at, at the time. So we're like, eh, I guess we'll do this homeschool thing. This is really <laughs> weird. And I don't have a minivan. And it just seemed so odd. And our why has drastically changed over the years. And this is our why now. It is all about the discipleship of our children and training their hearts in righteousness because we only have our kids for a few years. I mean, I those of you who have grown kids, you know how quickly it goes. My oldest is 14 right now, and I cannot believe that she's already 14, that we only have another you four years. Can giving up so many hours a no, day for her? I can't. I mean, and, sometimes I can, honestly. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, I could imagine. Well, you know, I could imagine that. Sure. <laughs> and and I want to say sometimes we need breaks as moms, and yes. that is important. And that's okay, but that doesn't mean you send them in to, to a place that they're going to be destroyed for crying out loud. You can right. have a break and still protect your children. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And and it's okay to need to take a break. We all need that. Oh, yeah. Um, and you your kids to. need a break from you. Sometimes, you know, um, you talked earlier about about enjoying being with your kids. You know, yes. I love being with my kids. And, and we talked about this on one of the other sessions. I don't remember which one, but that oftentimes people will say, well, I, I couldn't stand to be around my kids all day. Mm. Well, that's likely because you're not the one training them. You're right. not the one discipling them. You're allowing someone else to raise your children. And then you're expecting them to come home yes. and 
behave the way that you want them to behave. Right. Well, if you're not going else is building a foundation and then they're bringing that foundation into your home and it doesn't fit with your life because your life is built on God's word. Right. And they're building a foundation that isn't. And no wonder you can't stand to be around your children. Right. Right. And that's, that is not God's plan for your family. I want to read another verse to you. Um, this is actually, uh, it's Joshua 22 uh, verses five. Uh, it's verse five. And, um, it says only be, and this is Joshua uh, reminding the Israelites of the, the words of Moses, but I love the way that it's written in this um, chapter. And it says, only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord commanded you to love the Lord, your God, and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. You guys, that is the whole purpose of life is to serve the Lord and to love him and to cling to him. And how can our kids learn to do that when for 16,000 hours, we're putting them in in an institution that is, like you said, Abby, teaching them everything that is contrary to the word of God. Absolutely. It's unfair. And And then we act shocked when we look around our culture and see what's going on. And honestly, I mean, to hit on something, it's like, why are we so surprised that kids are shooting each other for crying right. out loud? Look what is happening around you. Right. It, it is not, it's really not a shocker when you do anything us away from God's way. What do you expect to happen? It's not going to work. I don't care how pretty you package it. It's not going to work. And, and like Yvette said, it, it, we have to teach and train this to our children. It's like the deer. If it, they were literally led to their slaughter because nobody showed them the way out. Nobody taught them how to get out. Everybody got lazy. Hey, no snow's coming. We're lazy. We don't have to worry about it. It's not going to affect us. And pretty soon they're dead everywhere because nobody taught them the way. Yeah. And and I, I, I've gotten this question a lot that says, okay, and I think we've kind of hit this, but I mean, another analogy when people say, okay, I, I get that. We need to teach it. We're going to come bring our kids home at the end of the day. We're going to debunk every lie. We're going to, we're going to go through this. And I was talking to someone the other day and I said, you know what? It's like, um, it's like sunblock. It's like if I'm outside all day, every day, seven days a week. Right. And, it, and I don't put sunblock on. And then at four o'clock, I'm like, oh shoot, I got to get some sunblock on. It's four o'clock. And I put sunblock on for the last hour of my day. That is not going to negate the effects that the sun had on me all day long. My, my skin is still going to be tanned. I'm still going to carry Everything I did all day long. Yeah, I got sunblock from four to five and all day Sunday or maybe a half a day Sunday when I was at church. But it's it's the same way with our kids. We will still carry that tan. When you look at me, you will still see tan. It will be in me. It's not something I can get rid of. It's going to be a part of what built me and made me. My skin will be tanned from being in the sun. And one hour of sunscreen isn't going to change that at the end of the day. It's like that with your kids. It will be interwoven into the foundation of who your children are. When they are grown, they will be like their teacher. And I'm not talking Miss Sue in third grade. I'm talking the teacher, the system that is teaching your yeah. children, the overarching sister system. So I don't care if Miss Sue's a Christian and you know, you know her values and morals. She's not the teacher behind what your kids are getting. Right. She's just the mouthpiece teaching them what she's been taught to teach. At the end of the day, it is going to be interwoven into their core being, what they are learning all day. And your one hour at the end of the day, if that, and your couple hours on Sunday, you can't undo it. You can add to it. And now they have a double foundation and they're tan with a little bit of sunscreen on. But that's not what God's called us to. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. Um, okay. Hold on. I'm looking for questions because I see that you guys are popping them up. Um, and if you have more questions, please uh put them in here. We would love to answer them. So, um, okay. The first one says, what is a good discipleship plan for teenagers 13 to 17, even with homeschooling them their whole lives? Sometimes I worry that there are gaps in their understanding of the gospel. We do a good, uh, we do go to a weekly homeschool community once a week. Um, let me first say that the word of God does not return void. Mm -hmm. If you are pouring God's word into your children and you are teaching them every subject from a biblical worldview, they're, they're going to come to understand scripture. Um, however, yes, there are resources apart from God's word. And, and, and we've talked a ton about this this week. Don't separate the Bible as a s- single subject and then do all of your other subjects. We, you, what you have to understand is that everything that you're teaching them should point them to Christ. You know, science should be taught from a biblical worldview because, and, and science, especially, I look at that and I think science is 
all about creation. Every bit of science is about creation, whether it's the human body or the solar system or whatever it is, ecology, it's all about creation and, and God as creator. And so when our kids understand science from a biblical worldview, they will better understand their creator. And there are many, many good options for um, curriculum that is taught from a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. um, history is the same way. When you teach history as Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, then you're beginning history from a biblical perspective. And you teach them how God, you know, the, the God's plan for mankind and the mistakes that we've made and how that has affected mankind. I mean, that that is teaching from a biblical worldview, English, grammar, everything, even math, you can teach these things. Math is one. God is a God of order, not chaos. And he is a God of absolutes. Mm -hmm. Two plus two will always equal four. It is never going to equal 12. Never, ever, ever, no matter how hard we try. A man is a man. A woman is a woman. That is an absolute fact. Right. And so just like math is absolute, God's word is absolute. And so when we teach things from a biblical perspective, that helps. In regards to um, to a discipleship plan, other than teaching from a biblical worldview and, and just reading scripture with your kids, worshiping with them, praying with them, um, there are a ton of resources. I The one that keeps coming to my mind right now is uh, Kim Sorgis, who is, uh, she's the author of Not Consumed. Um, that's a, a blog. She has some fantastic resources for teenagers and and pointing your kids towards Christ. So I would definitely mm -hmm. check her out. I think she's in the vendor hall um, as well. So I think you could probably just link to it, but notconsumed.com is her website. She was actually on the panel, what day? I think Tuesday, Abby, right? I saw um, together. One she, of the <laughs> she was at, she was part of one of the round table panels. I think it was on Tuesday. And um she has some fantastic resources. We will try to put together some other resources um, if we have a chance. But but for those of you who are watching, if you have some good resources that you've used for your teenagers, please pop them in here um, and, and give some suggestions for those things as well. Can, so, you, Abby, can, you, read, can you read that again? Because I'd like to add the question. question. Yeah. Yeah. It says, what is a good discipleship plan for teenagers 13 to 17? Even with homeschooling them their whole lives, sometimes I worry that there are gaps in their understanding of the gospel. Okay. We, we do a great, uh, we do go to a weekly homeschool community once a week. Okay. So I do want to share too, that your job is not, I mean, there's going to be gaps because our journey with Christ, our, our, our walk with God is constantly growing. It's, you're not going to graduate a kid at 18 and they're going to have everything in their walk fi figured out. You're, you're, your job as a parent is to build a foundation, to teach them to go to God's word and to pray and to see what God's word. I think we've lost that in the church. We, we've we lost the, the teaching of go to God's word. Did you know that everything you need for life and godliness is in there? He tells us everything you need is in there. So <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think we, we have this thought of I need to have my kids um, at the end of their walk, at the end of their journey by the time I, they leave my house. And I look at my walk now and I've I've been a Christian for many, many years. And I think from where I am now and where I was even 10 years ago, the Lord has brought me a very long way. So if you are teaching your kids God's word and you are um, praying for and with your kids and you're teaching them how to go to God's word, then any gap that there is, God's going to work through that with them. They're going to work that out. They're going to constantly be growing in the Lord. If anybody can say, oh, yep, at 18, when I left the house, I got it all figured out that's not how it works. That's not how it works for anybody in the Bible. That's not how it works. So, so take rest mom that, that you're doing the job. Here's the deal. Your job is what God has called you to do. His job is to work out the rest with your child. You're, you're not going to give your kids salvation. That's between the Holy spirit and your child. That's between the Lord and your child. Your job is to be faithful to the calling God has given you, yeah. which is to teach and train up your children. So, so take a breath do what God has called you to do and trust that he will fill in the gaps, that he will fill in the gaps, that he will do what you can't. Yes. Amen. There's a great book called Already Gone, and it's written by Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis. Um, it's a book that I would highly recommend. As a matter of fact, I think there's a video as well that I've never seen the video, but I've read the book. Um, and the whole premise of the book is really why are kids walking away from 
their faith today from the church. And, mm -hmm. and it's what it comes down to is that kids don't have a solid foundation. They don't know what they believe or why they believe it. And so, you know, in, in our short 18 years of having our kids, it is our job to teach them truth and to teach them, you know, why, why we believe what we believe. And if you don't know mom and dad, what you believe, read God's word, surround yourselves with godly men and women who will teach you because you can't teach your kids what you don't know. And, and if you don't know it, learn it together, read God's word together and study it and learn it together. And God will use that. Don't feel like you need to have every answer and you need to, uh, there are so much about the Bible that I don't understand. And I mean, I'm never going to stop learning, but that's part of the, right. the whole purpose of homeschooling too, is to teach your kids how to learn. Right. So when they go out of your home, they will know how to learn. Someone commented here and said, I'd recommend focus on the family's truth project. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have, our family has gone through that. That is a fantastic program um, that, that kids, and I would say probably for middle school and high school, like she said, um, is a great time to go through that with your kids, but it really mm -hmm. does help to set the foundation of why you believe what you believe right. so that they can hold on to that. So. And let your kids see you because we don't know everything. Shocker. <laughs> the older I get, the more I realize that I don't know everything. Someone commented 18 year olds think they do. Yeah, I, I totally thought I knew everything. <laughs> um, but as, as our kids see us go through things, are they seeing us go to God's word or are they seeing us go to a million other places? Um, and if your kids are watching you go to God's word for everything you do, they are going to naturally learn that that's where they should go when they yep. have a question. So be yes. an example. Yeah, be an example. Read your read your Bible. You know, I try to do my Bible reading before my girls get up, but sometimes they'll get up when I'm still reading and I'll just bring them alongside of me and, and they'll yeah. sit and they'll, you know, read with me. Sometimes I'll just sit quietly. Sometimes I'll read out loud to them. Yes. Let your and don't don't do it, you know, where you're like, look at me, kids, I'm reading yeah. my Bible. Um, but and, but and talk about it. As a part of your life. Let them let yes. Them see yes. what you're doing. Well, and, and talk about it with them all the time. Um, you know, Deuteronomy six, you know, when you, just when you're living your life every day, find ways to bring God's word into just your everyday conversation. And sometimes it takes practice to do that, but if you're intentional about it, you can find ways to do that. Mm -hmm. There's, um, two things I would recommend. Um, one is Ginger Hubbard's, um, uh, wise words for moms. Um, that is a great tool for uh, discipline. But there's another thing that I have. And, and Garrett, if you're listening, maybe one of the girls can bring this into me really quickly. It's called the Child Training Bible. I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, Abby, um, but it's fantastic. It's a Bible that has a bunch of... Oh, is that with all the colored tabs? Yes. Okay. We have one of those and there's there's the child training one. And then there's also one for adults. And the, it's yeah. uh, that we use that. I use that every yes. day in our home. It's brilliant. It takes a lot of work to do it, but it's one yes. of the greatest Bible studies for a parent to do. I, when we built that, when you have to build it yourself, it yes. is so educational and it yes. helps get you into God's word. Right. So basically you need it, a link to that. Cause that I, is I will, I will link to that somehow. Um, but it it is a fantastic resource. I'm, yes, it's wonderful. I know Lacey had it out yesterday, and I'm not sure where it is. Anyway, it it goes through just different virtues and characteristics and stuff, and and then it's you tab your Bible and highlight different verses in your Bible, so you can go directly to that. So good thing. It's I know that sounds ridiculous. So it's hard example, to understand when when a kid is lying. You 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 it, it, you go to the lying tab and it has all the verses on lying tabbed and highlighted in a specific color so that you're not scrounging going don't lie because i'm pretty right. sure god tells us that we shouldn't lie like right, right. you're actually taking them to the word and it has it all laid out for you right right um yes one of the questions here um sherry's asking what do you say to parents who have their kids in christian school um do you i, I have an answer for that but abby i'll let you take that one first um i i'll let you answer that i think you know I'm going to let you go ahead and answer. Okay. You were you grew up in a Christian school, right? I did grow up in a Christian I school. I really believe that here's the deal. The best, the the best design, the way God designed it is for a parent to teach and train their children. That's right. Am I against Christian schools? No, I taught in a Christian school, but you know what? People were still dropping their children off to me to teach. Right. Um, and that's not really God's best design. It's a parent's responsibility. The other thing I think you need to be careful about Christian schools is, so my husband um, went to a Christian school and he, and he also, he was homeschooled for a while. He was public schooled for a while. He was Christian schooled for a while. And he said, and just be careful. He said, the Christian school 
he had far worse influences in the Christian school than the public because so many parents dropped their kids off to be reformed. There's so many kids dropped their parents off because their kids were struggling. Um, they were naughty kids. So the parents yeah. dropped, well, all kids are naughty kids, but you know what I mean? They were really <laughs> struggling kids. Yes. Uh, so the parents would dump them off there to have someone else teach and train them in God's way. Yes. And so he said it was not a good setting for him. And I know not every Christian school is that way, but really the question is, when we go to God's word, I just want to point you back. When we go to God's word, who does God tell to train your children? And just ask yourself that. You guys can ask me a lot of questions and I'm going to point you back to God's word because, and you can do that. You can say, what does God's word say? Who is supposed to be teaching and training my children? I don't read that it said it's a Christian school. I read that it says that it's a parent's job. Right. That's right. what God's word says. Well, that's basically, <laughs> yep, that's basically my exact answer. Um, again, I grew up in a really good Christian school. I loved the school that I grew up in. Um, I had teachers who really poured into my life and into my heart. And and much of who I am today as a Christian is because of them. However, um, the, the influences of some of the other people that I went to school with were not so positive. And I, I see Christian school much like a parent who is not taking seriously their role to disciple their children, but sending them to youth group. Thank you, honey. Sending them to youth group on Wednesday night mm -hmm. and Sunday morning, Sunday school, and just saying, okay, I'm our yeah. kids are good. They've got their Bible training and their Christian -y training, and we don't have to do anything about that. It's all taken care of. And I'm paying a lot right. of money to have someone else do that for do me. Do my job. I to, mean, I'm right. sorry. And do it's, your job. Sure. And let me just say, I don't say it to shame anybody because I know that there are circumstances where, you know, I mean, I, mom is going through something, you know, may, maybe, well, I know a lot of single moms homeschool and that's a different topic, um, but maybe mom has to work full time. And maybe, or maybe she has dad to, says, no, this isn't right. happening. You will not homeschool. Absolutely. And she is honoring God by honoring her husband. Right. And there are a lot of women like that. And you know what? Yes. I want to tell you girls something, if that's your case, God will bless your obedience to him. God will, God will protect your children in a way that is different because you are being obedient to God by honoring your husband. So we're not saying that you're raw. I mean, everybody has different circumstances, you know, everybody yep. has different. And if you have to put your kids somewhere, I would say do it in a Christian school over a yes. secular yes. school. Of course, that's a better choice. So everybody has different circumstances. Yes. Yep. And that's exactly the thing is, is if you have to put them in school, you cannot homeschool them for some reason. If you have to put them in school, put them in a Christian school mm -hmm. by all Absolutely. means. I would, I would literally, and I'm going on record saying this, I would keep my kids out of school and never, ever educate them before putting them in a public school. I would because not they're put being my kids, educated there because they're, they're be being educated. indoctrinated and educated yeah. in a way that is completely contrary to the word of God. And I would never put my kids in a public school. As long as the Lord allows us to homeschool them, we will mm -hmm. always home educate our children. Right. Um, I cannot I think, believe how many comments are coming in from people whose kids are either in public uh, Christian school or have been to Christian school. And they're confirming everything we're saying. It's yeah. worldly. It's not. I mean, read right. the comments. And those I, are from people that were there and are right. there. <laughs> I went to a, I went to both. Well, I grew up in private schools, but I went to a Catholic school one year. And I remember the, I was only there one year and I told my parents, it's like paying a lot of money to go to a really bad public school because it was really <laughs> the school that all the rich kids went to. And they actually had more money to do the drugs and to party oh, and yeah. to do all of the other things. So, and that's not every Christian school. And, and so I'm, I'm not hundred percent down on Christian schools. I'm just saying, I, like Abby said, I think the best option is for you to have your kids at home and to homeschool them because God has called you as their parent to be their teacher and to be their authority and to teach them the morals and values. And, and, um, so anyway, we'll leave that one. Cause I know that there's other questions yeah. really quickly. And I, Garrett, I, oh yeah, go ahead. So oh, this yeah, is the child training Bible. Um, and we'll try to put a link to it. So inside here, here's tabs at the top and inside it's hard to get this all in here. Mm -hmm. Um, it has all of these different things. So anger, complaining, defiance, and there's one called the virtue training Bible as well. So you make this yourself, you kind of buy the kit and the, the Bible, and then you put it together, which is fantastic, but you would go to fighting mm -hmm. and you would click on the, or not click, click on <laughs> not <a button. laughs> you would go to the first pink tab and then you have it. Let's see, where is it highlighted somewhere is a verse. So the one in pink would be a verse on fighting. And that one says, turn away from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. And yeah. so she has set up all of these verses already for you. And then you 
tab it on the top, the bottom, um, and the side. And you can, it's a very quick way to grab scripture on all these different things. So anyway, and that's enough takes, about that. It takes some time to make, but let me just give you a hint. It's a really great thing to do with your kids, like for maybe Bible time, yep. you know, look up the verses with them so you can work it into your day to get the word into your kid. It's not like you have to stay up at midnight to build this because it does take a little while. Do totally. it with your kids, set aside but, a day and say, today we're looking up the verses and fighting and everybody gets out. And so it's, it's a really great opportunity. I also want to go back because we talked a little bit about, we're not shaming that. At this, everybody's walk is a journey. And I just want to tell you, so you know where I come from. I was a public school teacher and I will never forget sitting in my mother-in-law's kitchen. This was before my husband and I were married. I was just the little girlfriend and I was in college being trained to be um, an indoctrinator. And um, I remember she was so pro homeschool and I sat there and I was like, cause I come from a family of educators, indoctrinators. <laughs> and um, I said to her, um, homeschooling is so weird and it's so bad and it's so not good for kids. And I literally had this conversation. So we're not saying every, if you're listening to this going, I've messed it up. I thought this was okay. I thought I was doing the best thing. It's not too late. God changes hearts and God takes you from where you're at and he's going to take you to where he wants you. So that's my praise God. He got a hold of me before my kids got into school. Yeah. Um, but yes, I agree. And I mean, like, I, you know, I'm seeing one of the comments that says I'm feeling guilty for letting my first child go to public school through sixth grade. Please Stop. don't do that. We're, we are not here to condemn you and to convict you of that. Um, if, if you're just now realizing, okay, wow, this homeschool thing. Yes, we should be doing this. Let me say again, first, go to your first, go to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Next, if you feel like God's calling you to do this, go to your husband. And he is and calling make, you to and, His word and, tells you he is. Right. That's right. <laughs> and go to your husband and talk to your husband about it. And if your husband is not in agreement with it, then you just pray that the Lord would change his heart. But do not let homeschooling build a wall between you and your husband. No. Your marriage comes first and your mm -hmm. relationship with your husband comes before pulling your kids out of school. So, and so, and please don't feel guilty. You know what? God, God is so sovereign and powerful and he uses things at, like putting our kids in public school sometimes to teach us the lessons that he wants to teach right. us and to teach our kids. And so it's okay. It's not too late to go back and, and, and just start over, you know, just reset. So um, right. we're going to do one more question because we are just about out of time oh, okay. and we've got to get onto it, but, but we have a panel this afternoon. And yeah. so we will try to get to some of these questions this afternoon as well. And we're going to have Sam Sorbo on with us. So if you've ever had Sam, heard Sam speak, she is a firecracker. Um, so she'll be glad to answer some of your questions as well um, as our other panel members. And I will um, go through these this afternoon um, and okay, answer some. See if you like can Kristen answer. KH, I'd love to, I'd love to quickly. Well, that's the that. one I was just going to read. Um, okay. Really, we'll have to do this one quickly, but she says, oh. how can you engage with other Christian families who disagree? They either don't know that, uh, don't know all that's being pushed on the student or they think that their child will be okay. Um, one minute, sure. Abby. Okay. That wasn't the one I was going to share this session. Oh. One, take them to God's word. Because here's the thing is when you give our opinions, it can cause division amongst people because they think it's your opinion versus theirs. When we speak God's word, we're just speaking God's word. That falls on the Lord. So we, if you share these verses with them and and speak the truth in love, be humble. Um, I think that's what I have to say is, is really be humble and speak the truth in love. But take them to God's word because it, it's kind of like, when you're a wife and your husband says something, you can kind of default back on, well, that's what dad said. <laughs> like I'm off the, take him to God's word. This is what yeah. God says. This isn't me. I'm not preaching this gospel. I'm just living the living according to God's word. So this is what God's word say. And also don't be afraid because sometimes people want, I mean, she wants to hear it. If they're opening up these conversations, sometimes we're so afraid we're going to offend someone. But when we actually speak it, like that day at the park, I told you when they're like, we're going to put our kids in middle school to expose them. When I point took them back to God's word, it was like the light bulb went on. And rather than be upset with me, they were thankful. They were thankful that I would speak truth to them. So speak the truth in God, in love and then and then leave it at the Lord's feet. Yep. And pray for them. You know. Yes. Just commit, commit to praying yep. for for your friends. So I wish we could just talk all day long about this. This is so good. And you guys, thank you for your comments and your encouragement. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to say the thing that's hard to say because yeah. you know that it's it's convicting. I will say with this session, um, 
We'll make this session just available um, even outside of the Homegrown Generation Family Expo because we, this message needs to be out there. So we're, we'll make it available somehow so that you guys can share because I've seen some comments saying, oh, my friend needs to hear this or my family member needs to hear this. Um, we'll, we'll just make this one available for free so you guys can just share it wherever and with whomever you choose to share it with. And, and Abby and I will be glad to take the heat for it. You can let people get mad at us. Yeah. Send, them, send them to me. They can come find <laughs> send me. Them, send them to Abby and she's going to send them to God's word. So, mm -hmm. um, and so will I, but you guys, thank you for joining us for this. We are going to be back in just a few minutes with Jeannie Fulbright. Many of you are familiar with her and she's going to be talking about seven essential tools for developing self-motivated children. I think we can all use that. So, um, keep the questions coming. We will be back with Abby, Sam Sorbo, Christy Clover, and James Godtree uh, this afternoon for another roundtable session, our last one of the week. And so we will try to get to the rest of your questions during that session. Um, and we'll do our best to do that. So we love you guys. Thank and you so much. And you can so always much. send questions to us outside of this if we don't get to them. Come find yes. us. Yeah, we're, we're both we're on Facebook web. too. So um, you can message us that way. But thank you guys so much. Thank Bye. you, Abby. All right. Bye. See you soon. Bye.